Okay, so uh, are there any questions? Yes. Is it about the homework? Okay, maybe we can leave that for later, um, for the, the end. Um, let me um, just go back to the example, one example I was doing with the torus that um, I was slightly, getting slightly confused, and so let me try to clarify it. Um, we had um, discussed this already several times, this covering map. And we can um, picture this like this. And if we we think of this point, the standard way of doing it, this will be zero. This will these dots will be the integers, and so on. So. If we wanted to um, look at the torus, which is S1 cross S1, okay, what would be a covering of it? Would be the product of these two covers. So we would have the plane, so it would be covered by R2, where each uh, copy of R goes to each copy of S1, so it will be sort of a product covering. And the integers now would become a lattice. So if we use the same maps, the product of the maps, say this is the 0, 0, the origin of the lattice, of the plane, and um, this would map to the torus. So each one of the rectangles in the lattice maps to the torus in the way we discuss the identification of the sides. So if I lift a map, uh, a loop in the circle here, it lifts up, say if I started at zero, something that goes back and forth, whatever it does, and it ends in some other integer. And that integer we call it the fundamental, I mean the winding number, and we use that to identify the fundamental group of the circle with Z. So we do the same here. We know, we argued already that the fundamental group is Z cross Z, but this uh, covering map actually allows us to do this um, more precisely, and this is what um, he was suggesting last time, so let me repeated. So if you want to have a path gamma in pi 1 of the torus, say uh, base at 0, 0, then we know it's, the group is isomorphic to z cross z. If we want to find what maps to the, say, to be an, give an example, the pair is 2, 3. Let me put the origin here. So we just look at 2, 3 in these coordinates, and any path that goes from 0, 0 and ends in 2, 3, when you push it down, will be a class um, so this would be the lift of gamma, which is the path that um, has class 2, 3. So this would be 2, 3. And um, the picture I was trying to find last time and I didn't show it to you would be this. Um, so I did it like that. Um, it doesn't fit in the picture. So this is the origin down here. OK. And um, if I take this path that goes across several rectangles and map each piece of the rectangle that it crosses down to one rectangle, what we see is this. This is what I was trying to show you last time. So we start here, go up, 
till it hits the boundary, but this point is the same as that point, so it continues here. Then this point is the same as that point, so it continues there. And then this point is the same as that point, and finally it reaches this point, which is the same as that. So that's the uh, closed loop um, in, um, in the sort of rectangle form of the torus. And if you uh, want to see it a little more, you can fold it, and you can see how the path is supposed to go like this, like this, second, and then here, and there. Oh, I did it wrong. This here, here, there. Sorry? Now, the, unfortunately, we cannot fold this both ways without breaking the paper, so it's hard to, um, to uh, present the final picture on the torus. But I suggest you, you play with uh, something like this to be completely familiar with this story. And the thing I was a little confused, and I think I may have said it wrong, is the following. If we look, if this is called our A path and this is our B path, then the path in blue crosses it uh, here, there, so it crosses this horizontal segment here, there, and there, and that's the same as that. So it crosses it three times. Okay, so which is correct in the sense that this is the 2, 3, not the 3, 2, because um, if we think of the torus, and this is our A, and this is our B, and this is the base point, then a loop, that, like if we do B three times, is going to cross the A segment A three times. Okay, so the coordinate 3B of, the, of a path will translate in, in crossing the A path three times. And the coordinate 2 of a path will translate in crossing the B path two times. So it crosses the horizontal axis three times, and it crosses the vertical axis here and here, and that is the same as that, so it crosses it two times. So this path indeed is the path to three, which is what we were looking for uh, last time. Is that clear, what I'm trying to say? So you can, so we did this thing in two different ways. Right now, I looked at the universal cover, well, the concept that we'll come back to, but um, the, the plane is simply connected and it map is a covering of the space of the torus. And so when we lift the path, we already argued that it, if you start at a given point, it ends in a point that, um, that is uniquely determined. And this is how this isomorphism is achieved by sending a homotopy class to the ending point of a uh, lift of the path, uh, starting, say, at 0, 0. OK, hopefully this will, this was help, some help in clarifying this, this point. But um, topology, I find, especially algebraic topology, is actually fairly hard to write rigorous proofs and detailed proofs. So you have to combine trying to do that with a lot of intuition that is hard to transmit. And the best way to un get that intuition is with just doing the stuff with your hands yourself. So you should try as much as possible to do pictures, you know, use pencil and paper, scissors, you know, just actually physically think of what's going on. I think it will help a lot uh, the intuition. Then it's uh, sometimes hard to translate those things into detail and rigorous proofs, but you have to have a bit of both. I think it's very hard to go purely formal, um, but some of that, of course, is necessary. Okay, so what we're going to do is uh, continue with the fundamental group, and um, I'm going to do a little a bit of examples with um, the uh, figure eight. Okay. So, um, why don't we start there, and then I'll do a bit of the theory. Okay, so um, the figure eight 
is two circles joined at a point. And if we, we have two clear loops here, which are called A and B. And uh, hopefully by the end of the class, I've done enough to convince you that the fundamental group of this space is freely generated by A and B. Okay, so do you know what a free group is? Can somebody tell me what a f the free group in A and B would be? Maybe if you've seen it. You've seen the notion of free groups? No? He's saying the group generated by MB. Um, where does the word free, you think, come in? Uh, he's saying that the position of A and B uh, is free. That's where the word free come in. Any other thoughts? Yeah? There's no relation between A and B. Um, right. Um, what the free group means is that the elements of the group are going to be identified with strings of symbols which are at any given slot either an A or an A inverse and a B or a B inverse. And the only relation is that A inverse, of course, is 1, and B, B inverse is 1. So uh, you've probably seen, well, we discussed the free abelian group generated by two elements. That would be Z cross Z, right? So you have, so Z squared is the free abelian group in two generators. Okay, so for example, one generator could be one zero and the other one could be zero one. Everybody is a unique linear combination of these two elements, but the addition, the group operation is addition, so it's closer to the kind of things you do in linear algebra and so on. But the freeness comes because of the uniqueness. No combination of these two vectors is zero unless there is the zero combination. But so the analog on the non-abelian situation is where, um, so the free group in two generators, so it will be simply denoted by this, is generated by MB with no relations whatsoever. So elements are uh, words in A, A inverse, B, B inverse with the only condition is that if you see a B and a B inverse next to each other, or a B inverse and a B, or an A inverse and an A, you can cross that out. Okay, so for example, A squared B cubed A to the <coughs> minus one, B to the minus 15, A, that's a element of the free group. And there's no simplification you could do to it. That's what the element is. You cannot switch the A and the B in any way. Okay, so this is different from, say, um, A cubed, B cubed, A inverse, B to the minus 15, simply because it's a different word. Okay, the, the elements of the group are like words in the language of A and B, the only thing to uh, watch out, of course, is that if A, a tennis A inverse cancels out and a B and B inverse cancel out. But that's the, oh, those are the only relations. So this is, in a sense, a huge group, right? I mean, um, elements, um, is, and when you multiply, you can f just, you, multiplication simply means to put the words next to each other, to concatenate the words. Again, with this proviso, A, A inverse and B inverse, etc. Okay, so this is what the fundamental group of the figure eight is. Basically, any path is homotopic to a path that consists of, okay, tell me how many times you went through A, then through B, then through A, B, you know, until you're completely done. So this would be the word, this would correspond to the homotopic class, uh, class of a path that goes twice in A, 
then three times in B, then one inverse in A, 15 times backwards in, in B, and then one A at the end. Okay? And so that path is uniquely determined by this, this word. There's no way to simplify it, and two paths are going to be the same if the words are the same. Again, modulo that condition. Okay, but I will slowly try to unravel this, and I want to use this to elaborate further on the relation between the fundamental group and coverings. So far, we use the notion of coverings to help us compute the fundamental group of a circle, for example. But we'll see that there is a very, very close connection between coverings and fundamental group. And again, if you've seen Galois theory, fundamental groups and the subgroups are going to play the role of Galois groups and the subgroups, and coverings are going to correspond to field extensions. And the fundamental theorem of Galois theory is that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence, and a similar thing will happen with coverings and subgroups of the fundamental group. I mean, there's several technical details to fill in, but that's the one sentence summary. So to get into this, let me construct some covering of the figure eight. Okay. And um, the thing to notice, I mentioned this before, is that the figure eight has one point that is special. They will take it as a base point, naturally. Um, and in that point, there is a strand that comes in that has a label A, and a strand that comes out that has a label A, namely this and that. So if you want to keep things clear, there's the A sort of rows around. So one strand of the A comes out, one strand of the A comes in, and then, so, so this would be, um, one strand of the B comes out of the point, and another strand goes in. So to construct a covering, we can do the following. So think of the A cir circle. In the covering, what will it look like? Well, bef but below is a closed loop. When you lift it to the cover, which we know we can do because we proved these lifting theorems, it's going to either be a closed loop or, more generally, it's just going to be a little strand that starts somewhere and, and finishes somewhere. Where it ends and begins has to map down to the uh, point, the, the central point. That's uh, the the way this the covering map works. And so the same about B. So basically, what to look at a, a covering, we're going to see a bunch of things that look like A, closed circles, or a bunch of things that look like A, but that's been opened up. OK, so let me give you an example, and we'll try to argue why this is a covering. So here's my central point, my base point, say. Um, I'm going to have an A, but instead of having a B as below, I'm going to have a B that looks like this. Oops, uh, OK, I'm going to do my coverings horizontal so I have more space. So my map is going to go like this. Okay, now then um, I'm going to have an other A that looks like this and a B that looks like this. So what are the so what degree does this cover have? Degree is the number of pre-images of a point. Um, if I haven't said it before, I'm not sure I'll be able to actually prove it. But uh, the cardinality of the pre-image of any point is the same for all points. 
So if you have a covering that each a point has a finite number of pre-images, then we call that number the degree of the cover. I mean, there are covers that, of course, are infinite, like, for example, R to, Z, uh, R to the circle, but some covers are finite degree, like this one. So how, what's the degree of this cover? Three. There's one, two, three points that are all going to map to the one point below. So the pre-image of the main point here is these three ones. So this is a degree three cover. And what we can check to see that this is indeed a cover is that if we look upstairs at each one of the pre-image points, if we just focus a little disk around the point, it should look exactly like the point below. So they should have a strand of A coming in, a strand of I, A coming out, strand of B coming out, and a strain, strand of B coming in. So that's, if I did this correctly, this is how that should look around each one of the three special points. Now, <clears throat> so what is the pre-image of the whole segment A? What are the three lifts of A? There should be three lifts starting from any one of the three special points. I have a unique lift, right? A, a lift of a, a loop downstairs is unique once I say, when I, once I decide where I begin it. So let, tell me what is the lift of A if I start here? Just the loop. That's the lift of A if I start there. What is A if I start here? Up to there. So in this second lift, it opened up. Okay? It's, as downstairs is closed, but upstairs it goes from this point to this point. In fact, I'm going to give these points names. One, two, three. And so A, twiddle, right? The lift of A is either this going from one to one or from two to three. or from three to two. These are the three possibilities. <clears throat> Is that right? These are the three lifts of A depending on the initial point. So um, again, to write very carefully that this is a covering is a little bit tedious. So let's at least convince ourselves. So for example, if I pick a little open neighborhood here, um, it should be covered by what? Three little open sets like, that are homeomorphic to this, to it. So where are they? If I do sort of the natural, the most natural map. One is here. Here, here and, down. and down. Okay? So this is a evenly covered neighborhood of our point below. And you can see that this is going to work for any point other than the base point. And at the base point, all you need about it, if you pick a little neighborhood of it, it should look exactly the same way, which is what we already argued. Okay, so it's, a, it's hard to sort of perhaps write this in f full glory, but hopefully I'll convince you that's correct. <clears throat> so 
what are we going to do with this? Well, already we can see something here when we talked about lifting A. Because the lift of A, if we start at 1, um, it ends in 1. If it starts at 2, it ends in 3. And if it end, starts in 3, it ends in 2. So what we could do is we could say is that A, through its lifts, what it's doing is permuting these three points. Okay? And to get this straight in one of these um, pervasively annoying things, that once, sometimes you have to take the inverse instead of the map that you expect if you want things to go smoothly. So I'm going to consider the permutation of the of 1 to 3, the numbers 1 to 3, which are labeling the pre-images of the base point um, associated to uh, loops in the base, in the figure 8. So this is my base space. This is covering. Any loop in the base lifts to a map that goes from one of these three points and ends in one of those three points. Okay, but to do this, uh, again, to, for things to work out correctly, you have to go backwards. And the permutation is um, that what we're going to do is, so if we have a loop, what is this letter? Associated to a loop in the base, say gamma, is you say gamma twiddle of 1, you take, it's taken to gamma twiddle of 0. So you have to go from where it ends backwards. In this case, it's not going to matter too much, but if you have a more general, a bigger situation, it will. It's just because it's just our transpositions. Transpositions are inverses of each other. So let's list what this permutation is associated to A. It takes 1 to 1. And if it starts at, uh, if it ends at 3, it takes you to 2. And if it ends at 2, it takes you to 3. So in the more standard way to write this, we can say that it's, it's associated to the transposition 2, 3. And what about B? What does B get mapped to? If I start at 1, what happens, what does B do? It takes you to 2. So 2 goes to 1. Two, it adds in 2, starts at 1. If I start at 2 and I follow B, we go to 1. So, um, yeah, end at 1, start at 2. And at 3 is 3. So this is the permutation, the transposition 1, 2. Okay, so what we're going to argue is that this covering P, I'll, I'll indicate how to prove this. It defines a map. We already, we already uh, said this. P lower star that goes from pi 1 of the top, which I'm calling, I'm going to call it Y, and the base I'm calling it X, as we had before, from pi 1 y of any f fixed point to pi 1 of x. Okay. And um, the image of this map is 
is some subgroup. Um, in fact, um, in fact, p lower star is injective. We'll show this. So, in fact, what we have is an injection of this group of the cover, the fundamental group of the cover, into the fundamental group of the base. And this subgroup <coughs> will, um, if we um, insist of, on keeping track of base points, this subgroup will uniquely determine the cover. Okay, so it's similar to the statement that in, in Galois theory, this is a subgroup of the Galois group, and it corresponds to a unique subfield of the algebraic closure. If you've seen that, this is the parallel. <clears throat> and in fact, we can associate to this subgroup, in fact, if you give yourself a subgroup, you can um, concretely construct a corresponding covering. And I'll, I'll do a few more examples to give you a sense of what this is saying with this uh, figure eight um, case in mind. But before we do that, let's um, check one thing. So what is the lift of A, B, A inverse, B inverse? Okay, so let me bring back the picture. Can you tell me what does the lift of A, B, A inverse, B inverse looks like? Say, say starting at 1, because it will depend on where you start. Now, this is what I was trying, uh, hinting at before. We compose paths by the one on the left is the one that goes first. Okay, okay so I'm trans uh, permutations we usually compose in the other way. That's why we have to do this funny inverse thing. Okay, so we do first A. So we lift this by lifting each one of them and then taking the product, which is to say one after the other. So we lift A, starting here, that gives this loop, right? Okay, so let's, um, this is one. This is our um, A. Then we do B. Then we do A inverse, which will be what? This is A going this way, so B, A inverse will be that. And then we do B inverse, which is a loop like that. So what... Um, so this map takes one this uh, lift starts at 1 and ends in 3, right? Why don't we do the three lifts? So now let's do the lift starting at 2. And then we'll do it starting at 3. Okay, so we start at 2, and we do A, we have that, 
right? Then we do B. Then we do um, A inverse, which is this thing going back. And then we do B inverse, which is that. Right? So it starts at 2 and ends in 1. And then finally, if we start at 3, we do A, then we do B, and then we do, um, we do A inverse, which is this, and then we do B inverse, which is that. So B and B inverse. So we end at 2. Right? So we started at 3 and ended up at 2. Is that clear? Okay, so let's see. So this particular element of the fundamental group has an associated permutation of the fiber of the three points on top of the, of the base point, which is and now we have to be careful because now it will matter if you do it right or if you do it backwards. <laughs> Okay, so the way to, to get this straight, you have to look at where it start, sorry, where it ends and where it starts backwards. So one uh, starts if it ends at one, it starts at two. Two is three, and three is one. So this is the permutation that takes one to two, two um, to three, and three back to one. Okay, so. To just to, sorry, sorry, you just wanted to see it. Okay, so uh, out of uh, just to check our sanity, let's just see that this is in fact um, Yeah, um, I think I'll just leave it at that. So let me skip to what I was going to say. So what is the conclusion? What conclusion have we draw from this little calculation? Right. The fundamental group of the figure 8 is not a billion because... Um, this particular element, which if it had been a billion, would be the trivial class, trivial homotopy class, it would lift to, a, um, to give you a trivial permutation. Okay, so, so this implies... Okay, so there's several things here to fill in, but in particular, we see that... A, B, A inverse, B inverse is not homotopically trivial why is that by the way? how do we lift the homotopy trivial class? sorry? If, you, if this path were, were trivial, the class of it were trivial, it would be homotopic to the constant map equal to a point. How do you lift that? We'll just take it to any point that you want to, to the constant thing. And the maps are unique, so if it's homotopically trivial, it has to start and end in the same place, and it doesn't. Okay, so that means, um, hence, pi 1 of y with respect to any point is not abelian. So we claim a lot more. We claim that the group is 
the free group is far from being abelian. It's, it's as, as non-abelian as you can make it out of two generators. <clears throat> okay, but um, these are all things. So in, in, in principle, we had not seen a single example of fundamental group that was not abelian before. Okay, now we have a concrete example in our hands. So uh, to continue with a bit more of these examples, um, let me, as I mentioned before, Hatcher has a long uh, whole page of examples, but um, just to go quickly to, through some of them, um, let's see. Give me a, here's two points. Okay, give me a double cover of this figure eight not uh, figure eight space. So it has the, the pre-image of the base point has two points. So we have to pick for A and for B two different lifts and at each point it has to look like this cross with the A coming in and out and the B coming in and out. Okay, so let me start. Pick A to be this. And then there isn't much room. I have to pick what B, B is pretty much determined. Oh, sorry, uh, A and A, sorry, excuse me. No, otherwise the A and the B have to meet at one of the lift points, so I, that was wrong. A again? Where, from this point, what do I have to do? It has to be B, because at, at the crossing, it has to look like A, A, and B, B. Okay, so... Do B, B. So now this point looks fine. So he's saying that again here we have to put A and A. And if we don't want any other point, then it will have to look like this. Right? Okay. Tell me quickly, what is the permutation that I associate to, um, to A and to B? A is the identity because it takes, uh, um, yes, A takes one to one and two to two, and B, one to two and two to one, and it, it doesn't matter how we do it because it's its own inverse. Okay, and so you uh, can construct several uh, examples like this. Another example of degree two. Um, so this is degree two. Will be if we do A like this, and then if I do B here and B there, it would be the same, basically the same as when we drew, so we can have this instead. Okay, 
So that's another cover of degree two of the figure eight. And what uh, permutations do we get here? They both map to the same thing, to the permutations of transposition swapping one and two. So the way that um, the way that this works is that um, we have the fundamental group of the base, and we look at the cosets by the image of P lower star of the top, which as I mentioned, we'll see is actually a subgroup because the P lower star is injective. And these cosets are going to be in bijection with the points above X0. So in this example, the covering Y has a fundamental group that injects into the fundamental group of the base with index 2. So there's a coset that corresponds to the trivial class um, and a coset that corresponds to a uh, transposition. So, um, yeah. So we can identify, say, one with the subgroup itself and two with um, the other coset. Okay. And um, so, what is going to be <coughs> useful to have a space? a covering space Y that is simply connected. And that, um, remember, means that it has trivial fundamental group and is path connected. Okay. Okay, so I'll I'll say I'll end with uh, with uh, this example in a little bit, and then I'm, I'm going to go and, and try to do some of the theoretical aspects. So, but before that, um, give me examples of even without having seen the existence, we can try to find such uh, things. So, if we have such a Y, we call it the universal cover of X. And you should be complaining of the use of the word the, but hopefully we'll, you'll stop complaining afterwards. Because um, at the moment all I'm saying is any space that happens to be a covering of our base, but it's also simply connected. We call it a universal cover, but we'll see that it's essentially unique when it exists. Okay? So, uh, give me examples. X is S1. What is a universal, what is a cover? What is a cover that is, um, that is simply connected? R. We don't have a whole lot of examples, so S1 cross S1, the torus. 
Kafka squared, and we already used these facts uh, quite a bit to study the spaces X themselves. Uh, what else do we know? Well, something really trivial. How about the, if X is R? R itself. If it is a point. Is a point itself. Okay, so those are, okay, we don't have enough uh, tools to say give any more substantial examples yet, but let's give a try to find the fundamental, sorry, the universal cover for the for the figure eight knot. So what should it be? It should be something that looks like the examples we're doing. We will have a bunch of points. There are a pre-image of our base point, and in each one of them, we should see this cross, the A in, A out, and the B in, and the B out. Okay, but it should be simply connected. That's what we're looking for. So if we look at the examples like this we constructed, we have, it's a covering indeed, but um, this is not simply connected. Okay, so if we go A, A like that, it's definitely not a trivial class. Okay, so it should be something that has no loops. Okay, so let's give it a shot. Uh, here's our one of our, say, pick one of the base points that is supposed to be on top. It should have this cross picture. So let's just draw the cross. Okay, let's say we put the A's here horizontally and the B, I'm going to put it vertically. Okay, so now each one of these new four points should look again like this cross, but I don't want to ever come back because I don't want to create a loop that will prevent me from the space being simply connected. So basically what we do is we continue this. So we do another B. Okay, and I stop writing the labels because it's gonna become unreadable. And then you do the same here. And you can imagine that you do this with each time iteration with a slightly smaller size, say a half of the size that you had before. So this will um, fit into this sheet of paper. And it will, in the limit, give you a space that looks like um, what we want. Each cross has the right shape. And there is no loop because this is um, simply um, a tree. I mean, you never have something that closes back. So this would be the fundamental, sorry, the universal cover of the figure eight knot. Okay, so, and this is, this is not far, now we're not very far from proving that the fundamental group of the figure eight knot is a free group in two elements, because how do, how do, how do uh, lifts of paths look like? Well, a, a lift will, uh, if you take any word downstairs that corresponds to a uh, sequence of A's and B's or maybe A inverse and B inverse in the, in the figure eight, when you lift it, well, if you start here and you see an A, you go horizontally. If you see an A inverse, you go to the left. If you see a B, you go up, and you see a B inverse, you go down. And so if you scan the word from left to right, you, you can exactly say, well, I do so many steps up, so many steps down, so many steps north, so many steps south. And then at the end of the day, you're going to end in some uh, spot in the plane. And that spot, it, um, there's only one way to reach it. 
right? Is this is like having uh, this graph? It gives you a way, sort of a way to have coordinates on each one of these points. Each point is uniquely determined by a sequence of a, a inverse, b, b inverse, and so on. And you, if you see an a, a inverse, for example, you go to the right, but then you do a inverse, you go back. So you might as well not have done it. So if you cancel all of these a in, inverse and b, b inverse possibilities, you have a unique uh, um, way to, uh, to reach any given point in this picture. And uh, this tells you that um, there can be um, any relation, because if it were a relation downstairs, it will lift to the trivial homotopy, uh, the trivial path. So it's a bit of a hand wave argument, but it's not far from a, a, something one can write carefully, a proof to show that the, um, that the fundamental group of this figure eight knot is the free group in two elements. In fact, we're going to prove it next time rigorously in a different manner using Van Kampen's theorem, which is the other next sort of major theorem in the subject that we need to discuss. And I'll leave that for next time. But um, hopefully this way of seeing it also sort of gives you a bit of more intuition as to why is the case that this is the, the free group. Now, something I should point out that um, if you've never seen it, will probably come as a huge surprise. Um, so... Let me take one of the examples. Let's take this example of degree two. Okay. Say this example here. And let's say, take, um, so take this example. Take that to be the one point, and this is to be two. This A, A, B, B. A, A. Um, let's try to describe um, the fundamental group of this. Okay? So, what are elements, uh, sequences, words in A and B that actually are um, close paths here. So we start at one, A, um, is a closed path, right? So if I do this, I'm going to get a closed path. Um, let's see where find my the picture in in um, Hatcher. Okay, so. A is a closed loop. Then if I start at one, I could do um, B and then B. So I'm writing, so B squared upstairs is something that lifts the loop B squared below. And then I can do B, A, B, or A, sorry, B, and then A, and then B inverse. I can go back to the same spot. Okay. So these are closed loops. And so, in fact, they freely generate... Pi one of y comma one. Meaning that 
pi 1 of y 1 is free it's a free group in these three generators okay <clears throat> and pi 1 of y 1 is a subgroup of pi 1 of x 1 Okay, so this is the surprise that this is a free group in two generators and it has a subgroup that is free in three generators. This is kind of counterintuitive because one is a, used to sort of linear algebra where if you have a, a space of dimension two, it can contain a space of the subspace of dimension three. That's completely ludicrous. But in this game, in this world of non-abelian groups, that notion just doesn't hold true. So this is a pi 1 of this has a free group in two generators and this is, uh, has a pi 1 which is a subgroup uh, and is free in three generators and in fact you can have uh, a subgroup in as many generators as you like. And moreover, it's a theorem of uh, Nielsen and um, to get this uh, straight that every subgroup of a free group is free okay and it could be of any any number of generators okay and I spend more than I wanted in the examples because I think are more illuminating than giving proofs but of course we can't live on just uh, examples but maybe I'll do more of the, of the proofs um, next time I can find the statement can't find it. Well, um, I'll mention it again next time. So, let me end with examples, since I'm already carried away, uh, with a question. Um, if what I've been saying is the right um, understanding here, any subgroup of the fundamental group will correspond to a cover. Okay? And if you fix the base points, that's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So, in this example here, this subgroup generated by A, B squared, B, A, B inverse as a subgroup of the free group in two generators, A, B, corresponds to the cover Y given by that picture. So, to illustrate this, let me give you a subgroup and you tell me what the space Y is. Okay, let's give it a try. So, take um, the subgroup H of pi 1 x 1 to be the group generated by A squared and B squared. No, no, no. I want the subgroup of pi 1 of x below. See, below we have the free group of two elements. Any covering will give us a subgroup of the pi 1 below. And if you go all the way up to this crazy cross, you get the trivial subgroup. Okay? So the, fun, the universal cover in this... Um, so this has pi 1 of y 1 to be trivial. And this injects to pi 1 of x1, which is the free group of two elements. Okay, so this is, is supposed to continue. I'm not writing it, but it's supposed to continue in every possible direction. Okay, so this is an infinite thing. Right, so the way it goes is that a subgroup of the fundamental group downstairs corresponds to a cover, and vice versa. 
Again, if you're careful, you have to be a little careful with the base points to make this statement precise. But I'm somewhat ignoring that for a minute. Okay, so now I give you the subgroup, and let's try to figure out what is the corresponding cover. If, sorry? Two points. So he's suggesting that we take two points. Maybe you're thinking of this. Well, so this A, if we do it twice, is a loop. And a loop upstairs corresponds to a, um, a trivial element downstairs. So the subgroup in question contains A squared and B squared too. But it has more stuff in it. It has A, B. Or, yeah, so we can go A and go B, okay? And, um, well, there are other options, but they're all going to follow from that one, maybe. Or maybe we also need B, A. Maybe careful. Um, we basically have to look at all the little uh, cells that we see that are enclosed, and then uh, write the corresponding element. So this is theorem there that I think we no I think we're fine I think with that we cover all cases so again this is a subgroup free subgroup um, in three generators so it has a B that is trivial in this covering which we don't want it right we we, we only want a squared and b squared to be trivial Okay, so um, maybe I'll leave it to you to think about. Tell me next time. Okay? All right, so let's do a little bit of theory then to try to uh, fill out the things that um, I was saying mostly in words and pictures and so on. Okay, so the first statement that we would like to C is that if we have a covering map, let's say that y0 maps to x0, then we have, we know we have a map p lower star that goes from pi1 of y, y0 to pi1 of x, x0. And the statement is that this map is injective. And the beauty of this is that then we are associating to a cover of X a specific subgroup of pi 1 of the base. Okay? Because the map is injective, so we can see the image is a subgroup which is isomorphic to the fundamental group of, um, of the top. Okay, and I think I may skip most of the proofs because, I mean, many of these proofs are always arguing exactly the same way, and um, they're not necessarily very illuminating. The statements are a lot more interesting than the proofs. So I think I'll skip that. But that's one ingredient. The next ingredient is a statement about liftings in general. We talked about lifting um, paths to coverings and lifting homotopies to coverings. Now we're going to lift, we want to decide when can we lift an arbitrary map from a space to the base. Okay. And... Um, so the situation is this, we have Z 
and a function f to x and, uh, covering p to y. And we're interested in the existence of a lift, f twiddle. And we'll fix base points so we have a y0 that maps to x0 and a z0 that maps to x0. And the map f twiddle should also uh, conserve preserve the base points. So our map f twiddle is a lifting, so p of f twiddle should be f, and f twiddle of z0 should be y0. That's in symbols uh, the same as those two pictures. So what is a necessary condition? And tell me what the necessary condition is, and we'll prove that, in fact, is also sufficient. What's that? So he's saying that we need Z to be simply connected if we want the F tilde to be unique. We'll worry about the uniqueness in a bit. I'm more concerned of the existence of the F tilde at this point. So we prove that we can do this with no condition if Z is an interval. And in fact, when, if z is an interval cross an interval, because we've shown how to lift paths and how to lift homotopies between paths. But now z is arbitrary, um, but for the statement, uh, I want to assume that z is connected. And in fact, we need that is locally path connected. And as Fulton says in the introduction of one of the chapters, we'll see yet another condition that is very technical that is required for various statements. And these things kind of can easily get in the way. So if you want to um, concentrate on the issues, might as well take Z to be, you know, as... as um, as many properties as you need, but being simply connected is not one of them, okay? No, we don't actually need Z to be simply connected. Well, okay, le le let's get to the statement, then I'll, I'll explain what I mean. There's a, there's a necessary condition. And it helps to think in this functorial way. Right? The fundamental group is not just a group you associate to a space. It's a group you associate to a space and maps between the groups associated to maps between the spaces with all the properties that if you compose maps on the spaces, you get a composition of maps on the groups. It's a functor. So that is actually very crucial for this construction of fundamental group. You don't just sort of randomly associate a group to a space, but it has these properties that if you do things to the space, corresponding things happen to the groups themselves. Okay, so let me start with the proof of, of the phantom statement. And then we'll... So I'm going to show you what is the necessary condition, and then I'll argue that it actually is sufficient. Well, suppose we have the lift, okay? So what do we conclude from this? If we now take, so this is a picture of spaces. These are all continuous maps between spaces. Sorry. The proposition is still not finished or is halfway through. I'm just trying to, rather than dumping down the condition, I would like to find it with you. Okay? No, you don't. <laughs> Hold on a sec. No, you don't know what we're proving.
But let's try, let me try to find a necessary condition for the existence of such a lift. So suppose we had the F tuttle. So now we have a picture of spaces, maps between spaces. Now I apply to that picture the fun functor fundamental group. It will convert this picture into a picture of groups and, their, and maps between them. Okay, so we will have pi 1 of z, z, 0, maps by f lower star to pi 1 of x, x, 0, p lower star, pi 1 of y, y, 0, and then this map f twiddle lower star. So if we have such a picture of groups, what can we conclude about the relation between f lower star and p lower star? What he's saying is that the image of f lower star should be a subset, but more precisely a subgroup, because these are homomorphisms. The image of f lower star should be a subgroup of the image of p lower star. Yes? Because what we have here is that um, f lower star is the composition of p lower star with f to the lower star. So let me write that down as a necessary condition. If this condition does not hold, then we cannot expect to have a lifting of such a map f. So I'm going to write down that the image of f lower star should be a subgroup of the image of p lower star. Am I writing this right? So the statement now is full. I claim that that is actually sufficient. So what we need to prove now is that if you have a map F whose image at the level of lower star, F lower star, so at, at the level of fundamental groups, lands in a subgroup of the image of P lower star, then you can lift the map F. Okay? And in fact, if the map exists, it will in fact be unique. So the lift is unique when it exists. So now let's revise this statement where with the statements we actually already proved, which were the case of a path and a homotopy. What happens in those cases? What is the space Z? Is an interval or an interval cross itself? So what is the image of F uh, lower star in the case that Z is a interval? Well, if Z is an interval, pi 1 of it is trivial. The image is trivial and is included in any subgroup, no matter what P star is. So in that case, this condition is sort of vacuous. It's always satisfied. So that's why we never saw it. OK? So if you like, then a corollary of this statement is that if you have Z simply connected, as you were suggesting, then we will always have a lift. So your statement was correct if the question that we're trying to answer was, when can we always lift the map? Yes? Yeah, path. Um, I believe it has to be connected and locally path connected, which might imply. No, it's defined for anything. But um, I, I've chosen a 
a base point. So in fact, it will only matter for the path connected component that contains my point Z0. So it, yeah, so those are technical issues that um, are not sort of at the center of the matter. You need some hypotheses, but you definitely don't need simply connected. I mean, that's kind of the, the point here that we're trying to lift uh, things um, um, from a, a space that needs some properties, but not that is fundamental group is trivial. Okay, so I'm going to leave the proof of the other direction to you because uh, it's more or less you follow your nose with the statements. If you look at the proof of the case of lifting paths and you apply it to this, at some point you will have to use the statement, of course, but um, the ideas are pretty much the same all the time. Okay, so as a corollary of this, suppose you have two coverings, Y and Y prime. Okay, with two base points y0 that map to the same base point downstairs y0, x0. So what we would like to say is um, a notion of when these two coverings are isomorphic coverings. And for that, we want a map from y to y prime homomorphism that preserves the map P. So this is P and P prime, or rather takes P to P prime. So we want a homomorphism that fits in this commutative triangle. In other words, P uh, is P prime composed with H. So we, we have such a isomorphism of coverings um, if and only if, what do you think? So look at this this way. <laughs> Go ahead. So the I think you were trying to say is the image of pi one of p should be should be equal equal to image because first we want it to be a subgroup so that we have a map one way, but we also want to map the other way. So we want it to be also contained the other way around, and so they have to be equal. So again, there's a little bit of uh, thinking, some, um, a few little things to, to check to complete in this argument, but the f statement is that um, these two should be the same. So. <clears throat> Well, so this is going uh, some ways into what we were saying before. If we have two coverings, uh, they give us subgroups of uh, pi 1 of x, namely p lower star of, of pi 1 of y and p, lower, uh, p prime lower star of pi 1 of y prime. And um, if they happen to have the same subgroup, then the covers are not necessarily the same, but they're isomorphic. Okay? So this goes some ways into filling out this story between the bijection between subgroups of pi 1 of x and coverings. So rather than coverings, 
I should have said uh, isomorphism classes of coverings. Okay. So um, here, I guess, X has to have the same hypothesis as before because it's a corollary of the theorem. And a further corollary, what can we say about coverings of X, which is in the hypothesis of the theorem? X as in proposition. which is simply connected. On top. So this is the corollary, first corollary, the second corollary. I want a conclusion about coverings. So a covering of a simply connected space, which is locally simply connected as in the hypothesis of the theorem, has to look how? It must be trivial. What does that mean? We're talking about the space, right? I'm asking, I have a covering y to x where y with x is simply connected. So I think, I mean, you're in the right direction, but maybe let's make precise the statement. Go ahead. Sorry? What is the universal covering? So x is its own universal covering because it's simply connected. The, co the map x to x is a naturally a covering. But let's be a little careful. Um, I give you R. Give me many covers of R. So we have R. What are possible covers of R? R, two R's, three R's, any number of R's, okay? So the fact that it's simply connected doesn't imply that the, a covering has to be just R, just itself. But it implies that it's trivial, which is to say that we have R with, you know, uh, cover, uh, a trivial covering, so it, there are several copies of it, which could be, you know, whatever cardinal number of copies you like. So uh, the conclusion that I'd like to get, I, like, I want to claim, is that um, Y is the trivial covering, or rather is a trivial covering, i.e., Y is isomorphic to x cross some subset t, which is discrete. In fact, t we can take to, to be pi inverse of x0. OK, so let me just give you a sketch of the proof. So we have x going to x, and we take the identity map. Okay, because <clears throat> um, 
by the proposition, the pi 1 of x is trivial, so the image of p lower star is, um, well, it's just, just because the map, uh, so this is our f, the identity, it maps uh, the pi 1 of x to pi 1 of x, it's just the trivial group to the trivial group, it, it always satisfies the hypothesis, so we can lift this map, okay, and um, let me call it phi, phi, we can lift it um, so that phi of x0 is um, any point y0 in the inverse image of x0. So x0 is down here, and it has a whole bunch of pre-images. If I pick what I like the value of x0 to be, then there is a unique lift like that. And so phi composed with p is the identity of x. So the identity of x has a lift for every possible choice of a preimage of x0. And so when you lift that map, you are getting a... Um, well, you have to, you have to um, do a little uh, check, but um, this, the idea would be that this phi gives you a map to this the slice at that point that looks like x. If you choose a different point y0, you're going to get another slice. And so you, with this way, you could sort of slice your y, and more precisely, what you have to check is that you look at x, Cartesian product x inverse of x0, and you map that to y by taking x, y0 to phi of x. Sorry, it's phi. So this phi is attached to the y0, and uh, we have to check that this map is actually an isomorphism, is a homeomorphism. And um, now I think, now going back, that I forgot to say something very, very important, which is the, um, the correspondence between subgroups of the fundamental group downstairs and coverings has to include the word connected. Okay, I, re I did not, I don't think I mentioned that before in the hurry to make the statement. So already here, we see that if we have uh, the fundamental group is trivial. It has no subgroups other than the thing itself. So it must have only one cover, if what I said before was correct. But that's only true if you add the word connected to the word cover. There's only one connected cover of a simply connected space, namely itself. And we can just argue that if we don't include the connectedness, of course, you can have uh, all kinds of uh, covers. For example, you can have you just have as many slices as you like. Okay, so um, this goes some ways in proving what we were doing before, and all the covers that we were use, doing of the figure eight knot, for example, were all uh, uh, implicitly, it was only looking at connected covers, and that's why we um, only worried about subgroups. Anyway, I'll continue with this, and that'll be my last lecture. So I'll do a bit more of this and Van Campus theorem, and that's about all the time we're gonna have. So we'll stop here.